Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter one, part two of One of Us is Next by Karen and McManus. Um, I know that some people don't like when I do two parts or more to um, certain chapters and stuff like that of books, but sometimes it's easier for me to be able to upload content for you guys a little bit faster and um, stuff like that. So let's just get right into this video. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, please click off of the video now. You have been warned. Knox lunges for the nachos like he didn't just polish off two servings of empanadas and a plate of cookies five minutes ago. Careful, it's hot, Louise warns, lowering himself into the chair across from me. I immediately think, yeah, you are, because I have an embarrassing weakness for good-looking jocks that brings out my inner 12-year-old. You think I would have learned about after my one-sided crush on a basketball player landed me a humiliating post on Simon Keller's about that gossip blog freshman year, but no. I'm not really hungry, but I extract a chip from the bottom of the pile anyway. Thanks, Louise, I say, sucking the salt from one corner. Nate smirks. What were you saying about repression, Maeve? My face heats, and I can't think of a better response than to stuff the entire chip into my mouth and chew aggressively in Nate's general direction. Sometimes I don't know what my sister sees in him. Damn it, my sister. I glance at my phone with a stab of guilt and the string of sad face emojis from Rowan. Just kidding, Nate looks miserable, I reassure her. He doesn't because nobody wears that don't give a crap mask as effortly as Nate McCauley, but I'm sure he is. Phoebe Lawton, another Cafe Contigo waitress and a junior in our class, hands out around glasses of water before taking a seat at the far edge of the table just at the first batter from the opposing team saunters up to the home plate. The camera zooms in on Cooper's face as he brings up his glove and narrows his eyes. Come on, Coop, Louise murmurs, his left hand curling instinctively like it's a catcher's mitt. Play ball. Two hours later, the entire cafe is filled with the excited buzz after Cooper's near-flawless performance. Eight strikeouts, one walk, one hit, and no runs through seven innings. The Cal State Fulton Titans are winning by three, but nobody in Bayview cares all that much now that a relief pitcher has taken over for Cooper. I'm so happy for him, Addie Beams. He deserves this so much after, you know, her smile falters after everything everything. It's too small of a word to cover up what happened when Simon Keller decided to stage his own death almost 18 months ago and frame my sister, Cooper, Addie, and Nate for his murder. The Mike Hill Powers Investigates Thanksgiving special rehashed it all in excruciating detail from Simon's plot to trap everyone in de detention together to the secrets hurt. <coughs> he arranged to leak on about that to make it seem like the other four had reasons for wanting him dead. I watched a special with Brolin while she was home on break. It brought me right back to a year before when the story became a national obsession and news vans crowded our driveway every day. The entire country learned that Broin stole tests to get an A in chemistry, that Nate sold drugs while on probation for selling drugs, and that Addie cheated on her boyfriend Jake, who turned out to be such a controlling trash buyer that he agreed to be Simon's accomplice, and Cooper was falsely accused of using steroids, then outed before he was ready to come out to his family and friends. All of which was a nightmare, but not nearly as bad as being suspected of murder. The investigation unfolded almost exactly the way Simon planned, except for the part where Bro and Cooper, Addie, and Nate banded together instead of turning on one another. It's hard to imagine what this night would look like if they hadn't. I doubt Cooper would have almost pitched a no-hitter in his first college game, or that Broin would have made it to Yale. Nate would probably be in jail, and Addie, I don't like to think about where Addie would be, mostly because I'm afraid she wouldn't be here at all. I shiver and Louise catches my eye. He raises his glass with a determined look of a guy who's not about to let his best friend's triumph turn sour. Yeah, well, here's to Karma and to Coop for kicking ass in, the, in his first college game. To Cooper, everyone echoes. We have to plan a road trip to see him, Addie exclaims. She reaches across the table and taps Nate's arm and as he starts gazing around the room like he's calculating how soon he can leave. That includes you. Don't try to get out of it. The whole baseball team will want to go, Louise says. Nate grimaces in a resigned sort of way because Addie is a force of nature when she's determined to make him socialize. Phoebe, who shifted closer to Knox and me as the game wore on and the other people left, reaches out to pour herself a glass of water. Bayview is so different without Simon, but it also isn't, you know? She murmurs so quietly that only Knox and I can hear. It's not like people got any nicer once the shock wore off. We just don't have about that to keep tabs on who's being horrible from one week to the next. Not from lack of effort, Knox mutters. 
About that, copycats were everywhere for a while after Simon died. Most of them fizzled out within days, although one site, Simon says, stayed up nearly a month last fall before the school got involved and shut it down, but nobody took it seriously because the site's creator, one of those quiet kids hardly any anyone knows, never posted a single piece of gossip that everyone hadn't already heard. That was the thing about Simon Keller. He knew secrets most people couldn't even have guessed. He was patient willing to wait until he could wring the maximum amount of drama and pain from any given situation, and he was good at hiding how much he hated everyone at Bayview High. The only place he let it out was on the revenge form I'd found when I was looking for clues to his death. Reading Simon's post back then made me sick to my stomach. It still chills me sometimes to think how little any of us understood what it meant to go up against a mind like Simon's. Everything could have turned out so differently. Hey, Knox nudges me back to the present, and I blink until his face comes into focus. It's still just the three of us locked into our side conversation. I don't think last year's seniors ever let themselves dwell on Simon for too long. Don't look so serious. The past is the past. Right. I say then twist in my seat as, as a loud groan goes up from the Cafe Contigo crowd. It takes a minute for me to understand what's happening What's going on when I do? My heart sinks. Cooper's replacement loaded the bases in the bottom of the ninth inning, got pulled, and the new pitcher just gave up and gave up a grand slam. All of a sudden, Cal State's three-run lead has turned into a walk-off one-run one loss. <coughs> the other team mobs the hitter at home base, piling on top of him until they collapse in a joyful heap. Cooper, despite pitching like a dream, didn't get his win. No, Louise moans, burying his head in his hands. He sounds like he's in physical pain. That is bullshit. Phoebe winces. Ooh, tough luck. Not Cooper's fault, though. My eyes find the only person at the table I can always count on for an unfiltered reaction. Nate. He looks from my tense face to the salt still scattered across the table and shakes his head like he knows the superstitious bet I made with myself. I can read the gesture as plainly as if he spoke. It doesn't mean anything, Maeve. It's just a game. I'm sure he's right, but still, I really wish Cooper had won. That is the end of chapter one. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.